Good morning and welcome to the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. It's wonderful to see so many here for this press conference. The Academy has concluded its meeting and we are ready to announce this year's Nobel Prize in Physics. And as usual, I will read the announcement, first in Swedish, then in English, then the citation in German, French and Russian. I am Joran Hansen, I'm the Secretary General of the Academy, and with me here on podium is, to my right, Professor Olga Botner, the Chairman of the Nobel Committee for Physics, and on my left side, Professor Mats Larsson, who is a member of the committee and an expert in the field of this year's prize. And later on, we hope to have one of our new Nobel laureates with us on the phone line. This year's prize is about tools made from light. Årets pris handlar om verktyg av ljus. <coughs> Kungliga vetenskapsakademin har idag beslutat att utdela 2018 års Nobelpris i fysik för banbrytande uppfinningar inom laserfysik. Med ena hälften till Arthur Ashkin för den optiska pinsetten och dess tillämpning på biologiska system. Och med den andra hälften gemensamt till Gerard Moreau och Donna Strickland för deras metod att alstra högintensiva, ultrakorta optiska pulser. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has today decided to award the 2018 Nobel Prize in Physics with one half to Arthur Ashkin for the optical tweezers and their application to biological systems. And the other half jointly to Gerard Moreau and Donna Strickland for their method of generating high intensity, ultra short optical pulses. So, one half to Arthur Ashkin for the optic pinset and the anwendung of biological systems. Und zur anderen Hälfte gemeinsam an Gerard Moreau und Donna Strickland für ihre Methode zur Erzeugung hochintensiver, ultrakurzer optischer Pulse. Pour moitié à Arthur Ashkin, pour la pince optique et son application au système biologique, et pour l'autre moitié, conjointement à Gerard Moreau et Donna Strickland, pour leur méthode de génération d'impulsion optique intense ultra courte. Arthur Ashkin, Sautitiski pinzetti i ich primenienje v biologitiski sistemach. Gerard Moreau i Donna Strickland sa ich metod generacije visoko intensivnih ultrakarotkih optitiskih impulso. And you can see now our new Nobel laureates with us uh, on the screen, the Bambi. Uh, Arthur Ashkin was born in 1922 in New York City. He made his remarkable invention at the Bell Laboratories in New Jersey, in the United States. Gerard Mouroux was born in 1944 in Albertville in France, and he is currently at the École Polytechnique in Palais in France, and also affiliated with the University of Michigan in the United States. Donna Strickland was born in 1959 in Gulf, Ontario, Canada and she's currently at the University of Waterloo in Canada. Dr. Moreau and Strickland did much of their groundbreaking work together at the University of Rochester in the United States. Now I would like to ask the chairman of the Nobel Committee, Professor Botner, to make some remarks about this year's Nobel Prize. Thank you. Over the past six decades, Lasers and laser-based devices have become indispensable in many different areas of society. With its long-range narrow beam that can be focused on a tiny spot, a laser provides high power over a small area, useful for cutting, drilling, welding, and micro-machining. Other applications abound. Billions of people make daily use of optical disk drives, laser printers, and barcode scanners, or are entertained by amazing laser light shows. Millions 
undergo laser surgery or a laser skin treatment. The laser is truly one of the many examples of how a so-called blue sky discovery in fundamental science eventually may transform our daily lives. Today, we celebrate two inventions within the field of laser physics that have opened new scientific vistas, but what's more, have already led to applications of direct benefit to society. Optical tweezers, allowing control of tiny living organisms, and an amplification technique enabling construction of high-intensity, compact laser systems. And with that, I hand over to my colleague, Professor Larsen, who will give you more details. Yes, Mats, please. So, Arthur Ashkin invented the optical tweezers. And he did this in three steps. If you look at the upper panel, he realized that he could, using the radiation pressure from a laser, and push a small micro-sized transparent sphere in the direction of the laser beam. He also realized, the middle panel, that because the laser beam is not homogeneous, it's more intense in the center. The sphere will be pushed into the center by so-called gradient, gradient forces. And finally, he took a lens and focused the beam so that he could trap, he could keep the small sphere fixed in space. And we will now make a small demonstration of this using a hairdryer and a ping pong ball, and it will be my colleague in the committee, Anders Irbeck, who will do this demonstration. And please note now that he can tilt the hairdryer and still keep the ping pong ball under control. This is a simple test you can do yourself at home if you want. So, uh, of course, it wasn't the fact that he could trap a small sphere that was the real breakthrough. The real breakthrough came when uh, Arthur Ashcon uh, demonstrated that he could trap in the tweezer, that he could trap uh, viruses, bacteria, and even living cells. And this led to an, uh, a very interesting development, very important development. And here we will demonstrate what happens if we take a molecular motor. This is a molecule that is doing work in the cell. In this case, it's a kinesine, it's a, a protein, and it's attached to a sphere, which is now in the optical tweezers. And the molecular motor will now start to walk on a cellular uh, cell skeleton, but feeling the resistance from the from the sphere. It's like a gladiator contestant strapped with an elastic uh, band and you walk and it becomes more and more heavy to walk because the force is pushing you back. By doing this experiment it was possible to measure the force between the cell skeleton and the kinesine molecule and it was also possible to measure the step size. Now we come to the second part of this year's Nobel Prize uh, to Gerard Moreau and uh, Donna Strickland. And what you see here is the development of pulse, laser pulse intensity as a function of time from the very beginning when the first laser was constructed in 1960 by my man and up to 1985. And what you see, there is a first uh, rather sharp increase in pulse intensity, but then it levels off. And this became a problem because the technology of that time was not scalable. It was not possible to go to higher intensity because of amplifier damage. And the way to come over this hurdle was the invention of the chirp pulse amplification by Moro and Strickland. And this was really the core of Donna Strickland's PhD thesis. So the idea and what they demonstrated is the following. You take a short pulse, you stretch it in time, maybe a factor of 1,000. And then the amplitude of the pulse will decrease, also a factor of 1,000. Then you take the pulse and send it through the amplifier. The pulse is increased in amplitude. And finally, in the final step, you compress the pulse so that it has the same duration as your input pulse, but now with a much higher intensity. 
And here you can see the development of pulse intensity after the invention of the CPA technique. Basically, every four or five years, the pulse intensity doubled. And this gave uh, a possibility for a rather wide range of applications, both in basic science and in more practical applications. And <clears throat> here you see high-intensity uh, high ultra-short pulses. They are uh, between 10 to 100 femtoseconds. One femtosecond is a million of a billionth of a second. And in the upper panel, you see uh, very high-intensity pulses coming roughly one per second, like this. And uh, these pulses can be used for laser particle acceleration. You want to accelerate electrons or protons. And this is now a development that we can already see could be of importance uh, uh, for cancer therapy in the future. In the middle panel, you see pulses coming roughly 1,000 per second. The intensity is a little bit lower. And these pulses are adopted to a new field of science called attosecond science. And attoseconds is even much shorter than a femtosecond, one thousandth of a femtosecond. And by using these attosecond pulses, uh, you can explore how electrons are moving in atoms and molecules. Very short time scale. In the lower panel, the frequency has increased even more. There are now 100,000 pulses per second, but the intensity is a little bit lower. And these pulses are extremely useful for high precision measurement, uh, high precision um, um, uh, interaction with, with, with matter. And I give you one example how they can be used. And this is now a CPA femtosecond laser that is used to correct myopia or nearsightedness. And um, <clears throat> the femtosecond laser is in the cornea creating a small lens shaped piece of tissue which is called a lenticule. The uh, femtosecond laser is also used to make a small incision in the cornea so that the uh, uh, lenticule can be extracted with, um, uh, with a small instrument. And by doing this, you are decreasing the, 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 uh, the refractive power of the eye so that your focus is now on the retina and not a little bit before the retina. And uh, nearsightedness, I can assure you, this is something I'm very well familiar with. And so finally, we are today awarding the Nobel Prize for groundbreaking inventions in the field of laser physics to Arthur Ashkin, Gerard Moreau, and Donna Strickland. Thank you. Thank you, Mats. Uh, we may now have one of our new Nobel laureates with us on the phone. Dr. Strickland, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello, this is Joran Hansen again. I'm the guy who gave you the good news. Uh, what is it? 45 minutes ago or so? That's right. And right now we're having a press conference here at the Royal Academy of Sciences. A large number of journalists, and um, I'm sure they would like to ask you some questions. Are you ready okay. for them? Yeah. I guess so. Thomas von Heine from Swedish Television. Can, excuse me, can you hear him? No, I'm sorry, I cannot. There's something wrong. Sorry about that, we lacked a microphone here. Uh, congratulations. Um, I was uh, curious about uh, how you found this. Um, as it, in the short introduction, it was described as a blue sky discovery. And was it, and how? Uh, OK. Uh, so, so I don't know if you also have Gerard on the phone too, but uh, I was a PhD student at the time, just keep that in mind. Um, I think a lot of things, as always, is going on. Um, pulse compression was already going on. Uh, different people were trying to get short pulses amplified in different ways. Um, uh, but I think that it's somewhat, I guess, just thinking outside the box to stretch first and then amplify. Most people were amplifying and trying to just compress whatever they had amplified. So I don't know if that answers the question. Mm, thank you. More questions? The lady over there. You get a microphone. Okay. There. 
Thank you. I'm Anneli Megner Arn from Swedish TV4. Congratulations on the prize. Thank you. You are the third woman ever getting the Nobel Prize in physics. Is that what's, all? Really? <laughs> what's your comment on that? Uh, well, uh, okay. I, I thought there might have been more, but I couldn't think. Um, well, obviously, we need to celebrate all, uh, women physicists because we're out there. Um, and hopefully, uh, in this time, it'll start to move forward at a faster rate, maybe. I don't know what to say. Um, I'm honored to be one of those women. We expect more to come. More. Yes. Yes, there's a gentleman over there. Thank you. David Keaton from the Associated Press. Um, first of all, congratulations. Um, and, and second of all, uh, how did you react um, when you received the phone call this morning? What was your first thoughts and, uh, and your thoughts on sharing this prize uh, with, these other, uh, with these other laureates? Well, first of all, you have to think it's crazy. Um, so that was my first thought. Uh, and you do always wonder if it's real. Um, as far as sharing it with uh, Gerard, of course, he, he was my uh, supervisor and mentor, and he has taken uh, CPA to great heights, so he d definitely deserves this award. And I, I'm so happy that Art Ashkin also won. I think that, you know, he, he made so many discoveries early on that, that other people have done great things with that it's fantastic that he is finally recognized. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I'm Per Snaprud from the Daily Dagens Nyheter. In terms of... It's a newspaper It's in a Sweden. newspaper based in Stockholm. Um, okay. In terms of practical applications that make some difference in people's lives, what are your favorites from uh, your own research? Uh, I'm afraid I haven't done anything that was practical for, for somebody, I think. The, the main practical application of CPA so far has been in the eye surgery. It was the first one, and I think it is the one that is used by the most people for something practical, and it was already uh, discussed uh, in the press conference. Uh, but, no, I, I think it's, it's still being used mostly, um, I shouldn't say mostly, but I think the push towards higher intensities and shorter pulses and things will, will lead to even more. It's already been used for machining as well, I, sh I should say that. It does machine things like glass, just like it machines the eye. Thank you. Are there more questions to our laureate, to Dr. Strickland? Yes, lady over there. Uh, congratulations. I'm Sophie Chen Song from Green Post and Chan Radio. I'd just like to follow up this question, uh, the previous question. So in which field do you think your invention can be used? Can you elaborate a little bit? Thank you. In which field? Yeah, that you expect uh, further applications of, of the CPA technology. Well, I mean, I think, it, I think at this point, it's, it's just used almost ubiquitously in so many different ways. It is used in uh, laser machining. It, the hope is that it will work, you know, very large lasers are being built around the world right now. Uh, some of them are hoping to do laser acceleration. Some of them are hoping to, you know, cure cancer. Some of them are, you know, it, it seems to be just about everywhere, high intensity lasers, just because of the way it interacts with the medium is different and some new things are being discovered that way. But it would be in chemistry, physics, medicine, engineering. So this development has just started and we can expect much more to come. That's exciting news. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Dr. Strickland. And oh, thank you. we look forward to seeing you here in Stockholm in December. Great, I look forward to it, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Now, are there questions to the panel? I know you're eager to have your individual interviews, but maybe some of you would like to ask something while we're all here. No? Please. Did you talk to all of uh, this year's laureates? Yes, we did. Uh, there was a, a bit of a problem with one of the phone connections, and that's why we were delayed for five minutes. But we've spoken to all of them. And 
Dr. Ashkin told us that he may not be able to give any interviews because he's very busy with his latest scientific paper. <laughs> more questions? One more over there. <clears throat> the gentleman from Associated Press, I think. Yes, indeed. Uh, David Keaton, thank you for the question. Um, so this year we see uh, a female uh, laureate winner, uh, as was pointed out, the third only in physics. Um, we sp spoke in the last few years about uh, female representation within this prize. Uh, I understand that you cannot uh, talk about uh, people that have been nominated uh, per se, but would you be able to give us uh, an idea of the percentage of women that are nominated uh, for these prizes? We have not, I don't have the statistics uh, uh, here in front of me. It's a, it's a small percentage, that's for sure. And that's why we are taking measures to um, encourage more nominations uh, because we don't want to miss anyone. Let me point out that these measures that we have been mentioning in the last few days are is a part of a long process and has actually had no uh, effect for this year's prize. And it's important to remember that the Nobel Prize is awarded for discoveries and inventions, and uh, those who receive it have made major contributions to humankind, and that's why they get the prize. May I? Please. I mean, I can, I, we cannot give you the percentages, of course, but let me just point out that the percentage reflects the number of women in science back, if you go back 20 or 30 years. So the number has been increasing steadily over the years, but the number of nominations rather reflect the percentages as they were, say, two or three decades back in time. Thank you. Good point. If there are no more questions, thank you very much. Now the individual interviews, but we'll close this press conference. Thank you. And welcome back tomorrow for chemistry.
Mats Larsson, member of the Nobel Committee for Physics. Two inventions were awarded today. It was about the tools made of light. It sounds actually like science fiction. Can you say something of the history behind the optical tweezers, for example? Well, I think that uh, Arthur Ashkin, very soon after the uh, first laser had been constructed, realized that uh, suddenly there was available a tool of light of a totally different quality than you had earlier. Uh, and he started to think about how can one use this tool to manipulate objects. And um, he realized that um, by thinking about this, he realized that uh, just take a small micro-sized uh, transparent sphere should be possible even if the radiation pressure from the laser is very small it should be possible to manipulate uh, such a sphere and indeed he was correct and uh, already in 1970 he had uh, uh, demonstrated this so that um, but then of course there was a long development uh, one development that that went into the direction of manipulating atoms something much smaller than, than uh, microsite sphere. But he also started to think about something much more complex than a sphere, namely uh, uh, viruses, bacteria, li even living cells he could trap. So that, and that was of course the real breakthrough that uh, one could manipulate uh, such very complex objects. At the same time, you can say that the dream of using radiation pressure, yes. for example, like uh, solar rays, is a very old dream of mankind. Of course, yeah, if, you, if you go a long time back, I mean, already Kepler realized that radiation pressure from the sun could explain how the comet tails are behaving when they are coming in and out in the neighborhood of the sun. So, indeed, it is an old it is an old um, subject, but it was really the invention of the laser that put it into the laboratory. Prior to that, I mean, uh, you didn't have light sources that would work. Now we have a laser, so would it be possible to use optical tweezers in uh, uh, moving objects in space, for example? You mean up in, out in space? Yes. Um, I guess so. I haven't thought about that direction really, but um, um, uh, in space, I mean, I guess there you want to have, if you want to have more than one spaceship, you, what you really need is to keep them extremely precise with respect to each other. Uh, and uh, there the laser, of course, plays a very important role. Uh, and this is a development I think we will see in the next 20 years, for example, in, in in uh, space-based um, detectors for gravitational waves. And that a laser plays an extremely important role. And the other part of this year's prize is about high-intensity lasers, very short pulses. Uh, why did they want to develop such thing? Well, I think there are uh, several reasons. I mean, uh, if you saw the curve I did, uh, that was a sort of a plateau over 15 years and as a physicist you always want to go to the new frontiers you want to push the pulse intensity you want to go to higher and higher intensity where you really start to um, not only talk to the molecule or atom but really to seriously influence it and this is something that really started with the uh, the invention of the CPA technique because then you get pulses of sufficiently high intensity so that when interacting with atoms and molecules it was no longer a small perturbation but it was a drastic change of the electron shell of the atom and this then led to strong field physics and uh, autosecond metrology and physics, autosecond science. So that was an important um, uh, application rather unexpected I would say. I mean the, the, around 1985 there was no um, no clear understanding of what would happen if you expose atoms to such strong fields, strong uh, laser pulses. And now you can take a movie of what's happening in the atom. Yes, yes, you can uh, start to take movies of the electron motion in the molecule or atom. And this was, of course, science fiction for, for a long time.
You show the curve of, in the development of intensity for lasers, and it uh, kind of never stopped. How intense can those laser beams be? Come. I, I don't, I don't, I don't see a showstopper right now. I mean the. Um, there will be new materials, there will be new ideas, how you can... Um, the basic science is understood. Um, and then it's the question of the scale and how much you can... how big you can do things and so on. And uh, so I don't, I don't see that there is a... This will go on. And that's what I indicated with the dashed line. I mean, it's going on, on for, for one more decade. Um, how big are those instruments, optical tweezers, or uh, high intensity well, optical lasers? Tweezers can be a very small uh, instrument. Uh, that's more like a microscope. Uh, the uh, CPA-based lasers, I, as I uh, didn't, I didn't have time to show it here, but it can either be a very, very compact instrument that you use for eye surgery, which is something that fits easily into a. I mean, it's, more, it's not more bigger than when you go to the dentist, for example. I mean, it's the same size of instruments. When you come to laser plasma acceleration, then we're talking about really big lasers. I mean, filling up a, a, a big laboratory. But that's, the, but that's the beauty of this technique, is that it's scalable. It's scalable, you can scale it down if you want to have high rep rate, you want to have ultra-precise... Um, interaction with something, for example the eye, or you want to drill, or you want to make stands, and so on. Or you can emphasize really the high intensity frontier. And uh, if you interact the really highest intensity pulses with matter, then of course you are creating extreme conditions that doesn't really exist on Earth naturally, but for example may exist in, in, uh, in astrophysics in the interior of planets and so on. And, uh, so that's, that's the direction I would call laboratory astrophysics. It's extremely intense. <laughs> yeah, extremely intense, precisely. But, but still with a rather high rep rate. I mean, one hertz is quite, you know, it's quite often when you have yeah, this high. every second. Yes, every second. Um, Donna Strickland, one of mm. the laureates this year, is not only the third woman in physics, mm -hmm. uh, Nobel Prize history, but also she was a PhD student yes, when she yes, made this yes. uh, invention. Yeah. Um, do you have any good advice for PhD students today how to pick up uh, important issues to work on? I think if you're, a PhD, if you're a potential PhD student, you should look for something that really interests you. Uh, you should look for groups that are very good in that particular area that interests you and then try to start to get a PhD position in one of these groups. I think if you start with um, something that you doesn't really inspire you, I don't, I don't think that's, that's not right, then you're on the wrong, wrong track. You, you should cho choose the topic first, then look for people that are doing this and try to select the best. It's not easy, admittedly, but... Uh, Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you.